So part five then, we're on to, if you followed everything so far and if you're able to um, to replicate what we've done or what I've suggested you might do, that's great. So you should have basic understanding of really basic stats, standard deviation and standard error being the most important ones. You should at least know where to find the formula to calculate things like those things, as well as to calculate the most common effect sizes. So T, D, F, P, R, all those things that you're going to see in statistics sections in papers. There are formula for all of those things and there are formula to convert all of those things into each other. And you just need to know where to find the right formula at the right time. More importantly, once you know roughly what these things look like, you should be able to spot mistakes. Uh, you will make mistakes and I make mistakes and especially published authors make many mistakes. Some of them they don't realize. Yeah, so really really, this, this whole day should be seen as a, le uh, a lesson in uh, finding what's wrong with some reported numbers because most of the time that's the, that's the most important thing to focus on that will stop you producing uh, garbage in your meta-analysis. So another way to find problems in the literature and problems in your meta-analysis and try and correct those problems is to plot the data on some graphs. And there's two kinds of graphs that we're going to look at. One is called a forest plot and one is called a funnel plot. And they're both uh, mostly associated with meta-analysis. And as we've seen from one of the previous slides and what I've said before, there are a whole bunch of reasons why what you see in the published literature is not the same as what studies have been done. And what you read and what you, you're, you're aware of in the published literature is not what you need for, for your meta-analysis. So you've got to find as much of that evidence as possible. Um, the, the kind of things that get published tend to be the more interesting things or more high profile or more relevant or maybe just the easier to explain or they're the papers that were not rejected by reviewers or they were papers that had maybe a long-term investment in them. So maybe a whole research program over five years is more likely to produce data that gets published, whereas maybe a single undergraduate project might be done on exactly the same question, but it's very unlikely to get published on its own because maybe the student moves on, maybe the supervisor doesn't really care about the project. But we're never going to see those data, generally speaking. So we tend to see larger studies from larger groups in, in the larger journals, which are the more popular. All these biases, can be sort of summarized in in the term publication bias that's the other the other topic of the this section there's no way to correct for that let's let's be clear you cannot correct for publication bias you can try to estimate it you can try to guess what kind of studies might be missing you can make some assumptions about which studies are missing from the literature but you're just guessing so you're really just you all we have is the published data we don't have anything else by definition so we've got to try and work out what's really going on from this, this very selective view of what we're aware of. And one aspect of what we're aware of is that people tend to publish things which produce significant results more than not. Um, so if you find in your intervention that a drug is effective at curing a disorder or easing someone's suffering or pain, you're more likely to publish that study than if someone else on the other side of the world did exactly the same study with the same drug and found no effect of the of the drug at all. So in general, there seems to be a bias for people to publish significant, statistically significant results or positive sounding results. And so if you take a bunch of studies and only publish the ones which are significant, so if you basically choose which studies to publish based on the p-value, the literature will, will just be biased. You will only see significant studies. You won't see non-significant studies. And that has interesting consequences statistically. So if you are using this statistical measure to make a decision about whether something is worth publishing, your published literature will be heavily influenced by that number. And given that, as I think we've seen, and I've seen every time I've run that, that little quiz, people don't understand p-values, yet what they, do, what they do understand is if it's smaller than that number, they can publish. And if it's larger than that number, they can't. That's probably the most the least um, the least generous interpretation of what people really understand about p-values. So the rest of these things, forest plots and funnel plots, and funnel plots in particular, are about trying to work out how much this bias has influenced your, your data. So yeah, if you only publish significant studies, the literature will be biased. There's another interesting thing that, that occurs following this, is that if you only publish significant studies, 
then if you have a small sample, your effect size has to be much bigger. So if you only study, say, 10 people on your intervention, you're going to need a much bigger difference between your groups or effect of the drug or the intervention than if you studied a thousand people. Both of those are perfectly valid. I'm not, um, I would never say there's, you know, a right size and above that right size, you know, that's, that's all good. 10 people is perfectly fine for lots of studies, but there is this problem that smaller studies will be associated with larger effect sizes, assuming that we only publish the significant ones. That sentence is basically a description of the funnel plot. That's where we'll get to in a bit. If this is true, if there really is publication bias and that scientists tend to behave in this irrational way of only publishing results when they look nice, your meta-analysis will be biased and there's no, there's no getting away from that. You just have to accept it, that it's going to be biased. But let's see what you can do to try and estimate and get around that problem. This is fun. If you haven't heard of the, of the decline effect, it's very fun. Um, so this is a bit, this is similar to publication bias in that initially when people find, when people discover something, people tend to publish it. So if you find something strange or unusual or exciting, you, uh, you tend to publish it straight away um, and it gets accepted and it gets into the fancy journal and everyone goes, everyone gets excited. And then everyone else starts studying the same thing. This could take weeks in the case of physics communities, or it could take decades in the case of other, other communities. But in general, when other people start studying something, the effect size tends to get smaller um, over time. And it's, this is called the decline effect. And it's a curious phenomenon that you look at, a meta-analyst meta might look at over, over decades or over time. And there are various sort of reasons why this might happen. Why might, why might interventions be less successful over time? And it's not because the subjects know they're being interfered with. It's, it's because the science is maybe better. So you can imagine when you first do a study, your, maybe your equipment isn't very good or your methods aren't very good, or maybe you don't, don't really collect much data. And you, maybe you, you were just lucky so the first time you publish something, it's not a very good study and it gets lots and lots of media attention, for example, but it was never any good, ne never that good in the first place. And then later people come along, improve upon the study, remove confounding variables, collect larger sample sizes and maybe do more control conditions. And then the effect size gets smaller. So it's called the decline effect. And it's a very interesting meta analytic fact of scientific life. So big, sexy results published in Nature. In 2010, in, in the years to follow, better studies will be done, replications of those studies will be done, and the effect might get smaller or disappear. Back to what happens in meta-analyses. When you, when you click the button in your software, whichever software it is, to do a meta-analysis, you'll have the option of producing a forest plot. And that's uh, in this graph. This is an example from, I've stolen some images off Wikimedia and other places. So the forest plot is a very simple way of showing all the data from your studies. So on the um, on the x-axis, you've got the effect size. In this case, it's an odds ratio. So this is like the risk, say the risk of getting cancer or the risk of uh, some other condition after a particular intervention or say comparing smokers versus non-smokers, for example. Assume that that's what's being studied here. So this could be the risk of getting cancer in smokers versus non-smokers. If there was no effect of smoking, the risk would be one, so equal risk. The ratio of probabilities is one to one. Um, but if you're double the risk of getting cancer, if you smoke, then the ratio would be two. So this isn't like an odds ratio, a relative risk. Um, so on the x-axis is the effect size. On the y-axis is just the study and they've ord ordered them in, in date order. So we've got a bunch of made up studies in date order. Each study is a dot and a line. The dot will be the mean and the lines will be the confidence interval. So the 95% confidence interval, usually. If you're paying attention, you'll notice that these confidence intervals are not symmetrical. So they're shorter on the left than on the right. And that's that's fine. In this case, it's because they're, it's, a, it's a ratio, an odds ratio. So they've obviously calculated the confidence interval before putting them on this graph. So, uh, in, but in this case, because it's ratios, they can be asymmetric. Um, so each study is a line. So this is Smith and, Smith and colleagues, 1991. The mean will be a, a symbol, the 95% confidence interval will be a line, and you've got the same data on the right in text. The size of the symbol, so medium, medium, small, very large, that's usually the size of the, the sample. So this will be a medium-sized study. The 99 study here will be a smaller sample, slightly larger, and then two much larger samples. 
So the more evidence you have in your study, the larger your symbol will be. And you, you can also see this from the size of the error bars, the size of the confidence intervals. If you've got a small study, these two, you've got large confidence intervals. And if you've got a large study, you've got small confidence intervals. Okay, so one study per row, the mean and the 95% confidence interval for your effect size. In this case, it's an odds ratio, the data in text on the right. And then you've got five studies all doing the same thing. The dotted line and this uh, diamond at the bottom is now the meta-analytic effect size. So that is combining all five studies, what's the overall effect? And in this case, the line is the mean effect and the width of the, the diamond is the the confidence interval. So this is now the 95% confidence interval for the effect size across all five studies. And in this case, you can tell if the meta-analysis is significant by seeing whether this diamond overlaps with one. And it's obviously a very strong difference away from one at this point. So there's no overlap between the symbol and the line, meaning it's a significant meta-analytic effect. If you've been following very closely or you knew this from before, if you've got a 95% confidence interval like these are, you can do a t-test. You can do a single sample t-test just by looking at these data, right? So if, you're, if you've got a number outside of the, outside of the confidence interval and you do a t-test against it, a one sample t-test, then it is significant. So these numbers over here are significantly different from that box. And these numbers over here are significantly different. But all these numbers in the middle are not significantly different from, from that mean. And that's because the p-value and the t-test is exactly the same thing as the confidence interval. One tells you the range over which the p-value is non-significant, and the other tells you what, what the significance is. I've seen various arguments over the years, people saying, oh, we've got to abandon p-values and we should be using confidence intervals instead. You can find these arguments on Twitter. You can find whole papers written about them. Uh, it's very amusing to say, if, you, if you actually understand stats. Saying we'll get rid of p-values and just report confidence intervals means you don't understand what either of those things is. So what that means is you can look at this um, confidence interval. And I think this, these data have been constructed exactly like this to show this point. So in the first study, the confidence interval includes one. So you can just say by looking at that data, that this study did not find a significant difference between the two groups. The odds ratio included the confidence interval for the odds ratio included one, so it's not different. This second study, um, slightly smaller study, slightly larger error bars, but in this case, the confidence interval is exactly on the border of one on the left end. And that means that the p-value for this sample is 0.05. So because that confidence interval stops at one, the p-value is 0 0.05. So that study likely was published because, you know, 0 0.05, nice result. Uh, the third study, similar sample size, slightly larger error bars or slightly lower mean, and it now overlaps with um, with one. So this study did not find a significant difference with one. And that's kind of the point of doing meta-analysis, right? You've got one study which is not significant at all, one study which is on the cusp, as some people would describe it, p equals 0, 0.5. One study looks identical in every other way, apart from its slightly lower mean. So these three studies together do not individually don't provide strong evidence, but when you combine them, they, they show a pretty similar effect across the three studies. And then these these large, these two down below, they're obviously repeated five years late, five and 10 years later, they've realized something's happening in the earlier studies, they've gone and done a massive study, and they've got a very strong effect of the intervention. So the point of meta-analysis is to look at all of these data over, over 20 years, and say, even though you've got three quite weak studies starting off the literature, there have been these massive replications, and now the overall effect size is a big, big, strong one. So that's your forest plot. You can look at effects over time. You can group these studies differently. If there were maybe two different types of studies, you could rearrange the order to show maybe there are some studies done in animals and some in humans, for example. You could group them that way. Uh, there's nothing to stop you changing the order. This one was just done by time, it seems. So that's, and then the second type of uh, plot is the funnel plot, which I, I like the funnel plot. Very similar. Um, on the X axis, we've got the effect size, same, same as before. So negative in this case, minus two would be your half as likely. So less likely over here, more likely over here. And then on the Y axis, this is different now. You've got the standard error. So this is saying, given this effect size, what's the, the standard error? 
at the top of a funnel plot, the standard error is zero. So that means there was no measurement error at all. You've measured exactly the right error size. I mean, it never happens in reality. So this is a sort of hypothetical zero at the top. So if you had got the perfect study and you've measured everything perfectly, you would expect your, your real data point, your real optimal ideal data point to be zero at the top and then the, the real effect size on the, on the x-axis. So that the actual data you have, so you can never have data up here. It's not possible to have zero uh, standard error. So the actual data you've got are the dots, these black dots, 12 or so different studies. If you take the most extreme studies down here, you've got some, you've got a couple of studies, maybe three or four or five that show minus 1.5 relative risk, for example. You've got um, a few studies around minus one, and then you've got five studies just below zero. And then you've got one in the opposite direction. So one showing the opposite. This is a bit like saying um, if smoking causes if smoking makes you less likely to have cancer, for example. What you can tell from this graph is a little bit about study quality or study precision or sample size. So usually the standard error, because it decreases with sample size, if you get larger studies with larger samples, you'll have a smaller standard error. So that's equivalent on this graph. If you get larger boxes, you'll have uh, smaller whiskers over there for the confidence interval. On this graph, if you have a larger sample, you'll be further up uh, on the y-axis with a smaller standard error. So on this graph, you could say that the worst study or the least precise or the most variable, or perhaps it's the one with the fewest subjects, the worst precision data has an effect size in the opposite direction. So it has a positive effect size, whereas most of them are negative. So this study seems to be unusual in that it, it's very imprecise, it's very variable, and it goes in the other direction. By contrast, the strongest or the, the, the least variable or the, the largest sample, the, the best precision, the lowest standard error, this one has an effect size of almost exactly zero, which means no difference between control and experimental groups. And then all the others are slightly different. So you, on this graph, you need to look at uh, what happens to the, the highest quality and the lowest quality studies in terms of their variability. Do they show similar effect sizes? Are they very different? And is there any pattern? Um, so there's two studies here with quite high um, precision, but almost zero effect size. And there's one study right here, which, um, so this study, this dot here, right on the line of this, um, this sort of gray, dark gray line, that's the equivalent of this study here. So where the, the confidence interval is exactly overlapping with one, so it's a 5% p-value. On this graph, you can do the same thing because the, the gray line or the, the gray zones, this dark gray zone is the boundary between significant and not significant, basically. So if you're on this line, the p-value for your study is 0.05. So it's exactly equivalent to the previous graph where the confidence interval stopped at one. So you might think about this study, maybe they were just extremely lucky. Maybe they just collected their data and the p-value is exactly 0.05. And that's just how it was, and that's all fine. But you could be a bit more cynical and assume that the reason it's exactly 0.05 is because, I don't know, maybe they kept collecting data until it was significant or Maybe they massage their data a little bit. And so that's what the funnel plot is trying to do. It's trying to work out what would happen if there were missing studies or if people were sort of fudging the data a little bit. Is there any asymmetry? Is there any, are there any problems in this, in this graph? And we'll talk about what people look for in this graph in the next bit. So effect size on the x-axis, precision or standard error or sample size on the y-axis. And then these, these additional contours, these nice triangles, which look a bit like funnels, they are helpful in seeing where the, the lines of significance cut off. So in the white zone, none of these show a significant difference between the groups. In the dark gray zone, they're approaching significance on the cusp, if you like. Uh, the light gray zone, they are in the sort of less than 5% significance. And then the, the outer zone, they're very different from, from zero. Let's have a look at, there's a couple of examples here from the British Medical Journal have a nice article about recommendations for looking at funnel plots. There's a whole paper on how to look at a funnel plot. So here we are. 
So this is very similar to the previous graph. We've got um, odds ratios from one down to small numbers and up to high numbers and standard error on the Y axis. And these are two different meta analyses. So on the left, you, oh sorry, on the top graph, you have a bunch of studies which all come out as being on the significant, on the positive side of this funnel. So they're all on the left side, which means they're all showing a, you know, like a negative effect. And of these 20 or so studies, one is non-significant or two are non-significant, two are very close to 0 0.05 and all the rest are very strongly significant, you might say. But, and there's always a but. The problem with this graph is that this sort of pattern would only occur if you only tend to publish positive significant results. Because if you're randomly selecting data, random, sorry, randomly selecting participants and you're giving them your very well controlled study, you should expect to find effect sizes which are sort of normally distributed. So there should be like a there should be like a bell curve of effect sizes here. So the better, more precise effect sizes will tend towards the middle, and the, the less precise effect sizes will, will come out towards the edges. But it should be symmetrical. And what's happening in this graph is that it's very asymmetrical. They're all on the left, they're all pointing leftwards, they're all following the lines of these contours. And that suggests that there's some publication bias that only the the studies that are below 0 0.01 in this case are being published. And when you do find a study that's not significant, there's only two or three of them have been published. So you'd expect to find a lot more studies in this area and in the other sides of the funnel. And the bottom graph is a more realistic looking example. But this is a case where very few of the studies are significant. In fact, only one is. So one is on the cusp and one is uh, significant. But these, the funnel of these data looks much more symmetrical. There's like a, a more normally distributed bump. And if you divide the funnel into two halves, there's about the same number on the left and on the right. Whereas at the top, if you divide this, where you imagine the, the mean might be, if you divide it into left and right, there's many more studies on the left on the publication bias side than on the not significant side. Uh, you can just look at the graph and make, and that's pretty good. That's uh, that's pretty good. So for me, the top one looks like there's a publication bias, and the bottom one it doesn't. You could take a look and make make a judgment, and um, that's pretty good. Or you can use some statistics. Um, there's a bunch of things you'll get when you push the button on the on, um, meta analysis program. Um, there's a rank test. I don't understand these or how they work. Um, I haven't really looked into them, but they appear. Regression test. There are various ways of looking at how asymmetrical this graph is. Um, there's a thing called the failsafe n, and what that does is say, if you were looking at this graph, how many data points do you need to add at exactly zero? So if you put all these data, if you put lots of data on this line, how many data points do you need to add before uh, this sort of funnel becomes uh, symmetrical, before the, the effects become non-significant? Um, it's a slightly odd way of estimating the problem, but um, essentially it can, the bigger that number, the better it is. So if you have Sorry, if it takes very few studies to change the result of your effects of your meta analysis, then then that's a bad thing. If you only need to add a couple of different studies before you lose your effect, then it's not very robust. So these these are three things which get reported. I'm not really sure how to interpret them. So um, I, if you want to use those, I suggest you would look for some papers discussing them. Um, one of the most popular things which you can do in the software, and I think it's quite neat, but again comes with problems, is this thing called trim and fill. I've used this, I've done this myself, like actually run the algorithm and I think I did it in Excel, would you believe? But you can you can program it if you like, but it's it's in it's in all the software. It's in um, Jasp and Jamovi and it must be in R. So you can do all these things in in your software without having to worry about the details. What this does, and it's quite a nice paper, but a bit a bit technical. It um so if you look at your let's I'll walk you through this this one. So, so if you looked at this graph and you said it looks like there's publication bias, so it looks like the mean of the the mean of the graph effect should be about here, but what we've really got is lots of studies on the left. So can we add some phantom studies on the right, some missing studies on the right to try and make this more symmetrical? So looking at this graph, I would say, what's the most extreme point? And it's that one on the left. What's the most extreme point? And then what if I added something over here that was equally far away from the, the current mean effect size? So you take this point, flip it over the average and put it over here. And then you'd have a new funnel to look at with another point over there. So the algorithm goes like that, that you um, assume that large results have been are, are missing. You find the most extreme result in the same direction as the overall mean effect. 
you add a symmetrical missing result so you're making up data which is quite interesting this is why some people don't like it because you're literally just making up data so you make up some data to assume that you know this is this is something that's been missing and then you recalculate the mean again so you calculate the mean again with your one missing study added back in and if that new mean is substantially different to the old mean it means they're really you know there's a missing study that you you kind of guessed and so you keep it and then you keep repeating this loop two to four until adding more missing studies doesn't make any difference to the mean um it's slightly tricky to um imagine so i'm just gonna this is an example where uh, the trim and fill plot has been used so the black studies are the original studies and if you just if you ignore the the gray ones over here it looks like it's quite good but it looks like there's a few too many studies over here and not enough studies over here so the algorithm looks at the current mean and says what's the most extreme effect size in the opposite direction so that's the most extreme effect size in the on the same side as the mean so it says right I'll, I'll add that one over there and so that effect size is opposite that one so that's been added in to balance out this one then you recompute the mean and then you find the next most extreme sample so it's probably this one and then the trim and fill algor algorithm adds an opposite one over here recalculates the mean looks at that one adds that one looks at that one adds that one and it keeps going round and round adding these fake missing studies until you've got an approximately symmetrical it looks like a christmas tree now uh, until you've got basically a symmetrical christmas tree like graph when you get to the point where adding a new study doesn't change the mean or when the most extreme when the most extreme sample is now on the other side basically until it's symmetrical um, you then stop and so in this example you've got one two three uh, seven studies have been added so you've got 30 odd studies that started but you've you've created seven new studies uh, to add to your meta-analysis and some people don't like that and for, for pretty obvious reasons you have you know there's no you have no real idea whether anything like this is is correct all you're doing is making a strong assumption that all of these graphs should be nicely symmetrical and then you're adding studies and so you should never make conclusions just just on the the trim and fill plot um, it's always like a well, it's, it's a massive guess essentially